Hello everyone, this is Paul from DebateTheLeft.com. In one of my previous videos I exposed a leftist professor of the University of Utrecht, who in her dissertation claimed that the integration of Muslims was a great success. Digging deeper into her research it turned out that she had been hiding important results and did not report these findings in the conclusion of her research. Political correctness is a religion, and even academic researchers are indoctrinated with this religion. This is especially the case for fields like sociology, political science and many other fields such as European studies, ethnic studies, African studies, etc. People working in these fields often are not driven by truth seeking but instead by political correctness. And because of this the world of academia has become extremely corrupt. Academic studies are often cleverly constructed pieces of leftist propaganda. In this video I will show you another research conducted by Dutch pseudo-scientists. The title of the study is as follows. Islamic Gatherings – Experiences of Discrimination and Related Affirmation Across Established and New Immigrant Communities. This study was conducted by three researchers, Mieke Malipart from the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, Karen Pallet from the University of Leuven in Belgium and Merov Geisbers from the Dutch Institute for Social Research. When you read this study you can immediately see within seconds that the researchers are not objective and rational like researchers should actually be, but that they are instead ideologically driven. I quote 1. Introduction in many European societies, Muslim immigrants are facing increasingly overt and widespread hostile public attitudes, reflecting geopolitical tensions in the wake of 9-11. In the Netherlands, like in other Western European countries, public debates and political contention over ethnic or religious diversity center on the presence of Islam. So you can immediately wonder what they're even talking about, because in the Netherlands there is no real debate about Islam. Results of statistical studies on Muslims are ignored completely. We've had Ayaan Hirsi Ali, who left. We've had Pim Fortuyn, who got murdered. And now we have Geert Wilders, who is excluded from participating, even though he is the second largest party. And there is still no real debate. Whenever an actual dialogue takes place, such as in the occasion that you can see right here, with real experts, the left responds by accusing them of using Nazi rhetoric and then tries to limit the freedom of expression. The debate is shut off. And these experts? They are boycotted by the left-wing media. There is no real dialogue about Islam and Islamization in the Netherlands. This is apparent from a downward political trend in the public acceptance of Muslim minorities, a growing support for anti-Islamic political parties, and a shift in media attention to Muslims as a threat to Dutch culture and society. A shift in media attention? And that was in 2007? The reality is that the media has completely ignored Islam. If the media focuses on Islam, for example by inviting a few members of Islam to a talk show, it is just to have them play the victim card. If this sentence would be true, then you would have seen talk shows where they invited this guy to talk about Islam. And they would not only have him in the show to endlessly interrupt him and compare him to Adolf Hitler, but they would actually let him speak and explain his argument. The same is the case for this guy, or this guy when he was still alive. The idea that the media has focused on Islam is simply ridiculous, especially back in 2007. If there really would have been an honest and open dialogue about Islam, in which the best argument wins, facilitated by the Dutch media, back in 2007, the mosques and Islamic schools would have already been closed down and demolished years ago. Literally, because in an open and honest discussion the truth can't be avoided, and the best arguments are destined to come out victorious. In the early 21st century, a period in which attitude towards Muslim minorities became more negative, the Netherlands has seen an increase in communal religious practice, that is mosque attendance among Muslim minorities. So what you can see is that they assume a certain causal link. They assume that negative attitudes towards Muslims lead to an increase in communal religious practice. So if Muslims feel discriminated, they go to a mosque more often, because of the social support that this will get them. This assumption is later referred to as the rejection identification hypothesis. And this hypothesis is basically what this video will be all about, because it is nonsense, and actually the reverse is the case. 
Unsurprisingly, this hypothesis has never been proved, and neither will it be proved in this study, as you will soon learn. The hypothesis itself basically claims the following. It claims that the problems with integration and terrorism and violence, etc., is actually to blame on us, the native European population. And this is exactly the assumption that political correctness has built within it. If a non-Western migrant does something, it is assumed that it is just the result of grievances caused by colonialism and US foreign policy and discrimination coming from the native Western society. So in the end, the cause of any problem does not lie in the culture or the ideology that the non-Western migrants bring along, but instead the cause is us. And to even investigate if the cause of the problem can be found within the culture of the newcomer would be nothing else than an act of bigotry. So this is the rejection identification hypothesis. And this plays a very important role in this so-called study. So the goal of the research is to see if they can prove the rejection identification hypothesis. They will try to find a link between perceived discrimination and Moscatanus and religious identification, in which the former is the cause and the latter is the effect. Perceived discrimination is measured using a composite of two items. Personal discrimination, have you been discriminated by Dutch people, how often has this happened? And group level discrimination. Some people say that minorities are discriminated against by Dutch people, how often does this happen? Both items were measured on a 5 point Likert scale ranging from 1 never to 5 very often. The items are correlated at 0.51, which makes sense. Most attendance is measured by using a single question. How often do you attend a religious ceremony? With the answer categories 1 almost never, 2 multiple times a year and 3 at least weekly. About 2 thirds attend the mosque at least once a year and more than 2 thirds attend weekly or daily with a mean of 2.05 and a standard deviation of 0.8. Religious identification is measured with three items referring to the importance of religious identity. My religion is an important part of myself. If someone says something negative about my religion, I feel personally hurt. No one should question my religion. The answer categories range from 1 totally disagree to 5 totally agree. The items form a relatively reliable scale. And a religious identification is strong. Mean 4.1, standard deviation 0.8. So that's a lot. That's very close to 5. And if you look at three questions... I would say that is quite worrisome in and of itself. So then they do the numbers for Turkish and Moroccan Muslims and find that a large majority, 76%, perceive discrimination against minorities and significant numbers, 40%, also report personal discrimination. Ethnic differences between Turkish and Moroccan Dutch groups in perceived discrimination are small. Perceived discrimination is shown to be positively related to mosque attendance. So Muslims who perceive more discrimination more frequently attend the mosque. After that, they do the numbers for the Afghan, Somali and Iraqi Muslims. And the difference between this group and the other one is that the other one is more well established in the society. And this group isn't. The Turks and Moroccans have built organizations representing their interests, including the interest of Islam itself, such as by advancing Islamization. And the Afghan, Somali and Iraqi groups haven't. They find that the majority of all participants report some attendance and a minority attends regularly. Over 1 in 2 participants visit the mosque at least once a year, whereas 1 in 5 does so weekly or more. The three religious identification items form an acceptable skill. Religious identification is relatively strong. The two perceived discrimination measures correlate at 0.51. Among Muslims from new immigrant groups, a majority, 60%, perceive discrimination against minorities in general. And a sizable portion, 28%, also feels personally discriminated. And the relation between perceived discrimination and mosque attendance is not different from zero. This indicates that less established groups differ from the more established groups in study 1, which, although we cannot test directly, provides support for the hypothesis that the relation between discrimination and attendance would be stronger among more established groups. So the groups that do not have established communities do not go to mosque more often if they also experience perceived discrimination. Okay, so there are some problems with this study. 
For starters, it raises the question to what extent you can actually simply define these variables as such, do this research and draw these conclusions. In order to draw a conclusion about how members of Islam behave in certain situations, you really must understand Islam. And I am pretty sure that these researchers do not know of what principles Islam actually consists. Collectivism, supremacy, the concept of the kafir, the spread of Islam, deceiving the kafir, etc. As a point of comparison, imagine there is a Tibetan Buddhist population in the Netherlands and you are going to do a similar research, defining variables such as temple visit and feeling discriminated. I am pretty sure that you cannot draw a conclusion about the interaction between Buddhism and the majority population based on such research. In order to do such a research properly, Properly, you would have to dig deep into Buddhism itself and into the principles it consists of. An interesting case is the way in which the Buddhists of Tibet respond to the Chinese occupation. There isn't any violence and if they do protest against it, they do so by organizing group meditations and sometimes one of them sets himself on fire as a sign of protest. Now compare that to how the Muslims in Palestine behave towards the Israelis. This is a huge difference in behavior. And you cannot understand this type of behavior that they exhibit within the situation of a Chinese occupation without understanding the inner world of Buddhists. And to understand the inner world of Buddhists, you would have to understand Buddhism itself. Likewise, Muslims are members of Islam. So to understand the collective psychology of Muslims, you have to understand Islam. Now, if you understand Islam and therefore also its prophet, you also know that the man in question was always offended. When a little girl wrote a song about him, he felt offended and had the little girl executed. When the Jews of Medina thought he was a false prophet, he felt offended and later had him killed. There is this constant victimhood mindset ingrained within the Islamic mentality. And this can also be seen in the collective psychology of the Ummah, the total body of members of Islam worldwide. How did the Islamic communities within Europe respond to certain cartoons about their prophet? Hmm. Westerners generally ask themselves, what did I do wrong? How am I guilty? This obsession with guilt is ingrained very deeply into our collective psyche, which is why these pseudo-researchers are so obsessed with wanting their rejection identification hypothesis to be true, because they really want their own society to be guilty. Muslims are the opposite. They are never guilty of anything. Instead of asking themselves, what did I do wrong? They ask, what did they do wrong? Referring to the Kafir. So let's dig deeper into the rejection identification hypothesis. Earlier in the paper they said the following. As cross-sectional data does not allow us to distangle cause and effect, however we acknowledge that the reverse causation may also play a role, so that more religious Muslims may in turn experience more discrimination. As one way to challenge possible reverse causation from religion to religious discrimination, study 2 differentiates further between discrimination on religious, ethnic or other grounds. So they ran an additional analysis to strengthen their causal argument, meaning the rejection identification hypothesis. All the respondents who report personal instances of discrimination were asked on what ground they think they are discriminated against. 59% of the respondents attribute discrimination to ethnicity, 17% to religion and 24% to causes like gender or age. If causality were reversed, the more religious people would experience more discrimination, for example because of wearing a headscarf. One would assume that they would report discrimination on religious ground. The relation between discrimination and religious identification should thus primarily exist in the religious discrimination group. So this simply isn't true. As I just mentioned, ingrained within the collective psychology of Muslims is the idea that the kafir, the unbeliever, is inferior and to blame for basically everything. You can see this in every Muslim country. Muslims themselves are never to blame for anything. Instead, it is the Jews or the Christians who are to blame. So if a Muslim living in the Netherlands doesn't get hired after a job interview, 
he or she will tend to believe that the other person who is an unbeliever is to blame. When asked the question, why do you think you didn't get the job? The answer doesn't have to be religious in order to debunk the rejection identification hypothesis. The answer can be anything, as long as the unbeliever is to blame and not the Muslim him or herself. I didn't get hired because they are racist. And also, 24% of the Muslims reported to feel discriminated based on gender or age. This doesn't make any sense. Why would a Muslim girl get discriminated based on her gender? Or why would a young Muslim boy get discriminated based on his age? I highly doubt that this percentage is similar for native Dutch people or for other immigrant communities such as Antillians and Surinamers. Do 24% of the Dutch get discriminated based on gender or age? These claimed grounds of discrimination have nothing to do with reality, but instead with the interpretation of the people who are asked. And this interpretation is driven by simply attributing negative character traits to the kefir, the unbeliever. A mentality that is ingrained within the collective psychology of Muslims, and likely even more so in those Muslims who take their religion more seriously, which can be measured by simply looking at religious identification. So this 24% actually shows that there is something fishy about how those Muslims who identify more strongly with the religion view the unbelievers. It is not a surprise that the researchers didn't go further into this 24%, but instead simply took it and ran with it. The second study qualifies parts of the findings of study 1. As expected from a boundary making account of religious community building, among the less established group discrimination is not associated with more frequent mosque attendance. At the same time, the theoretical association between perceived discrimination and religious identification is replicated. In line with the rejection identification hypothesis, religion provides a positive social identity also for Muslims in less established community contexts. Yet these community contexts seem less effective in mobilizing social support, which can be gained through mosque attendance in response to discrimination. Finally, our additional analysis to explore causality issues indicate higher levels of religious identification for people who perceive discrimination on ethnic, religious and other grounds. This pattern of findings would be unlikely if the causal relation were fully reversed. That would mean that being more religious leads to perceptions of discrimination on all kinds of grounds. Although we cannot rule out a bidirectional influence, this strengthens the causal path specified by theories explicated above significantly. So as you can see, they are engaging in a lot of mental gymnastics. So they say that they cannot rule out a bidirectional influence. But how can they still claim that the rejection identification hypothesis still stands? And if they can't rule out a bidirectional influence, they also can't rule out a reverse effect, which is actually way more likely if you actually study Islam and the Islamic mentality. Their idea is that Muslims who feel discriminated go to their own community for support, which then increases the frequency of mosque visit, because that's where they come together. But the less established Muslim communities don't go to a mosque more often, as a supposed result of their perceived discrimination. But they do identify more strongly with their religion. This in and of itself actually also puts the rejection identification hypothesis under pressure. The less established communities also go to a mosque, so why would they not go to a mosque more often as a response to perceived discrimination? Because wasn't social activity with the peer group a way of dealing with the perceived discrimination, wasn't it? Another point is that religious identification and mosque visit are higher for the established communities than for the less established communities, and they also feel more discriminated than the less established communities. Could there perhaps be a link between the degree to which the communities are established and the strength of religious identification, which then also expresses itself in the typical hysteria of continuously feeling offended and discriminated? 5. Discussion Dutch Muslims have become the prototypical others in the eyes of the Dutch majority, as evident from widespread public hostility against the presence of Muslims in Dutch society. No. The unbelievers are the others in the eyes of the Muslim minority. This is as old as Islam itself. In light of theoretical explanations, we model the effect of discrimination on attendance and identification. But as stated before, we cannot disentangle causal effects on the basis of cross-sectional data. No, they can't. 
Our additional testing study too points to the fact that the results are not limited to religious discrimination per se, but extend to discrimination on other grounds. This points to the salience of religion for Muslims in the Netherlands and to the overlapping boundaries that Muslims are facing. Although this does not conclusively exclude the opposite causal pathway, from religious identification to perceived discrimination, it does support our argument. Hmm. So as you can see they are engaging in great degrees of mental gymnastics. They admit that they can't exclude the opposite causal effect, but they then say that it does support their argument, while it actually doesn't at all and instead proves the opposite effect, because the perceived basis of discrimination didn't make much sense. So why don't they truly get into the details and truly establish causality? In order to truly establish causality, one would need to model these issues experimentally. And here it comes. However, this would come at the cost of not being able to study different real-life groups who face real-life exclusion. Right. They don't want to truly establish causality but they instead prefer to focus on their political agenda of studying quote-unquote real-life exclusion. And I do not know how they smuggled in the word real-life here, because they were studying perceived exclusion and not real-life exclusion. And there is a difference between perceived discrimination and actual discrimination, especially when you're studying a group of people who feel offended and discriminated all the time. And doing so while your own biases really want you to find that your own culture is guilty of discrimination and exclusion, so that you can continue your feeling of white guilt. Isn't the dynamic between the members of the religion of political correctness and the members of Islam a perfect storm? Muslims probably couldn't have imagined a more convenient receiving culture than our own western culture based on political correctness. Perhaps Allah does work in mysterious ways. So this is the current state of social science in western Europe. All ideology, no science. And the worst part is that these ideologues get to educate university students. They pass on their ideology to their students, who actually pay a lot of money to get education and not indoctrination. This is a problem. This is Paul from TheBetaLab.com. If you're studying at a university and you suspect that your professor is driven by ideology rather than truth seeking, feel free to contact me and send me some of his or her work. I will gladly dig into it. If you like the content, please subscribe or consider supporting my work through Patreon. Your support is appreciated. And most importantly, never stop debating the left on Islam. Take care.